Hi, my name is Steve Bowles. I'm chair of the South Huron Climate Change Adaptation Advisory Committee, and I would like to welcome you back to this, uh, to another video that's part of South Huron's climate change video series. This week is the 20th anniversary of Waste Reduction Week in Canada, which this year runs from October 18th to the 24th, which means it's a great opportunity for us to have a conversation about waste. In this video, we've got a number of local experts lined up to give you some input and advice about waste reduction, including Michael and Lindsay Groot from Wholesome Pastures, a local business, Eco Exeter, an environmental group from, uh, from the Exeter area, Stacy Jeffrey from the Municipality of South Huron, and Francis Bayou, uh, the president of the Blue Water Recycling Association. We are pleased to have these experts taking part in this video series so that the community can learn more about where their waste goes, how they can reduce the amount of waste that they produce in their personal life, and how businesses might incorporate waste reduction into their daily practices. Waste reduction does not have to be complicated, and this video is going to show you where to start. So we're happy to provide you with this information, and we hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. The release of this video is very timely, as it is the 20th anniversary of Waste Reduction Week in Canada. Although we encourage everyone to reduce waste every day, this week in particular helps Canadians focus on key waste management issues and material streams such as textiles, electronic waste, plastics, and food waste. It is also an important opportunity to learn about how to extend the life of products that we often think of as no longer useful. The experts in this video will be speaking to many of the key takeaways from Waste Reduction Week. The content in this video will touch upon the four opportunities to reduce waste hierarchy created by the Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat, a hierarchy in which makes considering waste reduction a lot less daunting and also cues questions for consideration. I'm Lindsay. I'm Mike. From Wholesome Pastures. We're a regenerative farm in southwestern Ontario that focuses on healthy whole foods and a holistic farming practice. Wholesome Pastures, we focus on our local economy as well as our local environment. Um, we're trying hard to improve our local environment by collaborating with other people such as Osaba Bay Field Conservation, where we have planted over 1,000 trees. At Wholesome Pastures, we try to focus on our local economy by supporting local businesses. So we do our processing within 15 kilometers of the farm for all of our livestock and meat products. Um, the other products afterwards we try to keep within a 60 to 90 kilometer uh, distance from the farm so that we're really keeping that local uh, economy and job support happening. Um, we would love that we could have a really self-sustainable community, um, which is a big goal for us, as well as helping to support jobs in our area and um, close regions. Trying to limit food miles as much as possible in the current uh, environment is very beneficial as well. So if you can get your food, because transportation has been shown to be quite a um, significant factor in man-made climate change. Um, so if you can just shop local, go to your local farms that are focusing on building soil, preventing your uh, erosion, um, you're going to be doing a lot of things that are going to help, or that's a main factor in helping. So here at Wholesome Pastures, we are focused on reducing erosion as much as possible. Uh, historically, civilizations only last as long as their soil does, and uh, there's been a lot of civilizations that have failed after a thousand years when their soil cannot sustain growth anymore, vegetation. So, and uh, if we can focus on keeping the ground covered for as long as possible and recycling nutrients and water without having the water run off, take the soil with it, and uh, also protecting it from wind, we can keep building a healthy soil uh, for years to come. At Holton Pastures, we decided to step more into a reduced waste model. Um, you can utilize animals nose to tail 
uh, through your processor where they will take the bones and other kind of waste items and discard them or send them off to other agencies that may make dog food or other type of products. But to us, it made more sense for what comes off the farm to come back to the farm and we can find uses for it here. So if I can make a product where I use a compostable lip balm tube and only the garbage, or sorry, the only garbage is the label on this tube and you can peel it off and the tube is actually compostable. I felt like that was actually better than sending off our product to become something that ends up in single-use plastic type containers. So we moved to a model that reduces waste um, and also changed our farming model to be a regenerative approach where we implement a no-till practice and cover crop use. And our reason for that is because we want to ensure that future generations have healthy soil with lively organisms to support the food system in the future. The way that a lot of practices work today is degrading the resources and we want to be sure that we are able to support those future generations by being flexible and changing with current knowledge that comes up. So paying attention to whatever research is out there and modifying your strategies or practices is really important. So that was really meaningful for us um, where we both grew up on conventional farms and we've changed this practice to being uh, a regenerative model that incorporates everything from your field crops to your livestock and on our farm we don't just include a single species we believe you need to have that layer layering happening so we believe there's always room for improvement and we should always be reevaluating and reassessing what we're doing and does it match what the current needs are that exist today so with our packaging, we decided to go with something that was, I mean, first goal was comp compostable packaging. And it just makes more sense environmentally. Um, is there a cost associated with it? Yeah. But is it pretty trivial for the grand scheme of the impact that you might have? We would agree at Wilson Pastures, it does make a big difference. So for us, we actually look to reuse or reduce our impact. Um, so our neighbor who is the Garden Gate Gifts and Florals, they have actually given us bags of packing peanuts that are cornstarch and so they will actually decompose rather than the styrofoam type. Is there a cost difference? Truthfully I don't really know because I actually get them for free um, and she gets them in her orders so she also kind of gets them in a sense for free slash paid for but they're clean, there's nothing wrong with them, there's actually no reason that we can't just reuse them. We'll also reuse some boxes that we get when we have to order our products of packaging. Uh, we do get them locally, we source everything in Ontario and actually try really hard to source everything within 60 kilometers of the farm. Sometimes that's not possible because we don't have um, a ton of services or resources to necessarily cover everything that we need to be doing. However, there's a lot that we can source locally. So we also go with paper bags for our bagging of food and product. Um, that includes everything from our farmer's market to our store, rather than tying in plastic bags to put labels on it. Um, the cost difference to do this is pretty trivial. It's about 20 cents difference per paper bag to plastic bag when you're comparing the same size and quantity that you're going to order. So it's truly reflective of about approximately 20 cents depending on where you're ordering from. The added bonus to not using plastic and to use paper is that paper is compostable. So at the end of the day, if you want to throw it in your recycling bin, that's fine. If you want to throw it in your compost pile, also fine. Um, so a great little thing, you can throw even your compost garbage from dinner time prep in these and put them into your compost bin. It's really important to reevaluate packaging as well. So whether or not you are using plastic at present, don't feel like you have to stay doing that. Maybe look into another option. And once you find that option, 
you have it. So it's a lot easier to reorder a great product that has a better impact on the environment. So when we decided to launch our skincare side of Wholesome Pastures, our goal was zero waste in mind. So we wanted to use our animals and honor them from nose to tail in whatever capacity that we can. So as soon as I started going down the path of looking into tallow, I kind of went down to a rabbit hole and came to realize it is such an amazing product. It is so easy and basic. You don't need a bunch of other recipes or additives or preservatives. It is a great product on its own that your skin really loves. So I wanted to reflect how amazing that is in a natural sense and that it's been used historically for eons. Tallow actually was one of the things that initially um, help develop soap. So we've sort of pieced a bunch of those elements together uh, where our soap is created out of our oils that we can render down from our animal byproduct. So it's another thing that we keep back from the processor and we render it here on the farm and I do all of that work from start to finish. So none of the products as best as I can are ordered in from other locations. You can also use tallow oil for cooking, so you can use it in replacement of butter if you want to. Um, again, another benefit, another use that I think is often overlooked. But when we talk about packaging with our products, we look at our soap. Do we need to have a package on it? Does it need to have a plastic wrap around it? Not really. So we don't do that at all. What I will do is online, there is absolutely no packaging with it at all. And that is strictly because online I have all of the ingredients listed there anyways as a reference point. We don't sell our product into um, stores, although we have uh, teamed up we have teamed up with our local shop, the Garden Gate Gifts and Florals, to do some um, soaps being sold in their store. We did obviously have to put on um, product tags then, but also because we want people to know where the soap came from. So we try to limit it as best as possible. I don't have an example here, but I used um, minimal paper, approximately the size of a business card, and uh, twine. So both can go and be compostable as well. So that's an example of our soaps. Um, our lip balm is, I think, one of the coolest ones that we have, um, mainly because its impact is so little. So our label is the only thing that's going to go into the garbage. I have tried to look for other um, products or possibilities, but unfortunately you're also um, tied to the size of our container and it has to fit on that as well. So I'm always looking for new ideas. I'm always open to any suggestions that might come from even our customers or other businesses that we are chatting with. Um, our tube itself is made of paper, of basically a cardboard. So as soon as you're done using the product, you can take off the label, put it in the garbage, and put the tube in the compost pile. Um, so that's really one great thing. And one thing that I think people should really consider moving away from, because as we know, people love their lip balm, but the tubes are a plastic that is tossed very easily. So our body cream line. Um, online you'll see that we actually do a recycling program. So we're trying to minimize the amount of waste of containers and tins that goes into the trash or the recycling bin. So we have customers that return and get refills on their tins. They wash it out and bring it back to me and it, they're labeled with their name on it. And as time approaches, they may contact me and say, hey, next time you're doing a batch of lavender, please get me a body whip that is that scent. So that's pretty easy to do. Um, as long as they come back clean to me, I just refill them. So if they haven't been cleaned by the customers, that's their only responsibility, which is great. Um, same with our jars here for the larger sizes, they're glass. So if they don't get returned to us, they're still recyclable at the end of the day. So our impact there, I think, is quite low as well. Rather than having plastic containers um, and also we went with a lid that is also a tin lid versus a plastic lid. So all of that can go in your recycling bin at the end of the day.
So I strongly encourage any business that's out there that already exists or those that are starting up, do some research, reach out to other companies whose products you do like and see what their take is on it. Um, I do think that making this switch is a very envi environmentally conscious choice um, and is going to be very helpful overall in the future. Every little bit counts, so we're just asking for people to make one small change and it will make a big impact if everybody adopts one small change. The one amazing thing as well about changing your products or using everything from nose to tail or whatever your business uh, model is, is that you can team up with other community partners and that helps support local economy and growth and why not support your neighbours which is amazing. So. One of the ways we also do that is that we team up with a local seamstress and she helps us to create um, our leather purses out of our leather hides that we also get done fairly local. Again, we try to stick into that 60 kilometers, it doesn't always work out, but that's our goal and to us 60 kilometers is what local means to us. In addition, we can team up with um, a jewellery store in Exeter, the jewellery box, to get the hardware for the earrings that we sell. And what we use for the earrings is the leftover pieces of leather that we get from our bags. So we're really trying to incorporate a lot of different products by using everything. Um, and that's also included in our dog treats in which we keep the chicken heads back and we actually smoke them. So lots of ways to be creative, lots of ways to reduce your packaging, find a better environmental choice, um, and I would encourage anybody to do that. Hello, and welcome to this presentation about Wish Cycling. My name is Francis Bayer, and I'm the president of the Blue Warrior Cycling Association. I've had the pleasure to serve you for the last 32 years, but tonight I want to talk to you about something where I need your help. Wish Cycling or aspirational recycling happens when you put something in the recycling bin without knowing if it's actually recyclable. Or sometimes people actually think it's ought to be recyclable, so they put it in anyway. 59% of people believe that most items can be recycled, which is simply not true. Which means that over half the people are wish cycling regularly. Now, it's no wonder that people wish cycle all the time. I mean, you're being bombarded with recycling symbols everywhere, and most of those are actually unregulated. That means the manufacturers or those who printed them on the packaging or, or boxes that you are using are using it without any regulation and uh, they can, their purpose can be totally true or totally invalid. Uh, sometimes the symbols simply mean that the packaging or the material has recycled content in it. Sometimes it means that it is recyclable. Sometimes it just means it identifies the types of plastic or material that it's made of. It can mean a whole slew of different things. Unfortunately, most people associate this recycling symbol as something that means it's acceptable in the Recycling Blue Box program, and that's simply not true. I need you to remember that next time you buy something and what you're looking at to see what, uh, whether it's recyclable or not. Your local Blue Box program, or you're currently collected in wheelie bins everywhere, is really designed for printed papers and packaging only. And this means, you know, in general categories, you know, some, some papers, uh, some boxes, some cans, some plastics, and some glass. We'll look at those individually and uh, to, you know, go over what is actually recyclable and what's not. So when we talk about paper, we don't mean anything made of paper. We mean specifically newspapers, magazines, junk mail, box board like your cereal boxes, cardboard which is typically brown with you know the wavy layers in the middle, flyers, paper egg trays, the actual paper towel rolls, or the or shredded paper if it's bagged. Now, you know, it's just, these are the items that we can accept. We don't want your medical mask, your wrapping paper, your jigsaw puzzles, your tissue paper, or used paper towels, or even your coffee cups. Those are not recyclable. They're not accepted in our recycling program. And you shouldn't, we shouldn't find any of them in your wheelie bin. When it comes to metal, what we're looking for is steel beverage and food cans or aluminum beverage cans only. Uh, all metal lids are also acceptable. Now, it doesn't mean anything made of metal, like you don't want your lounge chair, we don't want your ammunition, we don't want your old bicycle, we don't want your chainsaw, we don't want your baking ware, your you know, old favorite fishing lure, your propane tank, 
saw blades, or your boat anchor. Those cause a tremendous amount of damage to your equipment. We're not equipped to handle that. We're not, we don't expect to see them in our pile. And when they come through the equipment, they shred our conveyor belts, they damage our optical computers, and they cost thousands of dollars in damage when they go through. Glass, we need glass bottles and jars. That's it. We're not looking for anything else. We're not looking for your window pane or your drinking glass or any ceramic goods or any mirrors or drinking glasses or anything like that. Simply bottles and jars. When it comes to plastic, well, there's, you know, it seems like everything in the world is made of plastic these days. And at one point, the industry tried to make it easier to identify which types of plastics by uh, agreeing to print a, a recycling loop or a Mobius loop on the packaging with a number in it. And that number simply identifies what type of plastic it's made of. It doesn't mean it's recyclable at all. It just tries to, to, to help anybody, any producers or recycler to see what you know, how to handle the particular types of plastic. Uh, in, in our case here, we will accept any bottles and jars, tubs and lids, any you know blister packaging or uh, that uh, you may receive some of your products in. Uh, really, uh, realistically, number one, number two, and number five plastics are PET, HDP, and polypropylene. Those have existing markets. We can market those worldwide, not a problem at all, all day long. The rest of them, the, 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 the threes and the six and the sevens, they, there's really no market, no existing markets for them. They're used as a filler in other products. Uh, you know, markets come and go. Uh, they're, they're very low quality uh, materials and, and nobody really wants those. It's just the one, twos, and fives. But again, it's just bottles, jars, tubs, and lids, and some you know packaging that you will find uh, coming to your home. That means we don't want other things that are made of plastic or that you may think are made of plastic, like your, your old lawn chair or your, your Christmas lights, your boat wrap, or your solar blanket, your needles, or ropes, or VHS tapes, ink cartridges, your vacuum cleaner, or your bowling ball. None of those are acceptable in the Blue Box program, and we don't want to see them. So please stop uh, sending us your trash and just send us the recyclables and, and you know things will be much easier. So we don't want just anything that's made of paper, metal, plastic, and glass. I mean, we sometimes even find that some wood in there. And I don't know whether people think that, oh, paper is made out of wood. They must be able to recycle it. We can't. It doesn't go through our facility and it causes damage and slows everything down and actually contaminates other products. So please don't give us those. Don't give us long stringy things or your needles or anything hazardous or any organic material. Uh, that would be great. If you do your part, recycling is smart, and we all do our part, and I'll give you an example of that. One of the material that we collect is number two HDP bottles, and when we collect those, we bring them back to our facility in Huron Park, where we separate them all, make a bale, and then market them. In our particular case, over the last year, we've collected over a million pounds of those containers and sent them to a company called EFS Plastics, located in Listable within our own territory here. EFS breaks those bales, shreds the material, removes any leftover material that might be inside, your leftover soap sh 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 and uh, uh, peanut butter or whatever else. Uh, they'll likely remove the paper labels. Uh, a lot of times the, the, the caps are also a different plastic. They'll remove those. And they make a new plastic pellet that's usable to make any new products. And they turn around and send it right back to companies next door to us, like XC Plus and Blue Water Pipe, where they make new products. XC Plus makes traffic cones out of those, and Blue Water Pipe makes the corrugated pipes that you see in the farmer's field all over the place that are used for about 50 years. Those million pounds of material that have gone through FS and gone back to Blue Water Pipe have uh, created over 6 million feet of uh, uh, corrugated pipe in the last uh, 14 months or so. So that's an example where you know we have the circular economy model right here in our backyard where nothing's going to the landfill. You know, we bring it back here, get it fully recycled, and it goes right back into a usable product. And that's when recycling works, when you give us what we need. So keep in mind, when in doubt, leave it out and stop with cycling. Thank you. Hello, we are Eco Exeter in this our story. It began three years ago in my science class when our teacher, Miss Amanda Keller, posed the question, how can we take what we're learning in the classroom and make an impact in our own community with it? Since then, we have used the platform Eco Exeter to create ecological change in our own community through various events such as pop-up shops, social campaigns, and other activities. With the outgoing support of Eco Exeter, we recently have had the privilege to create an executive that heads a group of students within our school. With this executive, 
we're able to collaborate with other schools and communities within our region to create a group of like-minded individuals who all strive to see green change in their own communities. Six made from fossil fuels are just over a century old. Production and development of thousands of new plastic products accelerated after World War II. Plastics revolutionized medicine with life-saving devices, made space travel possible, lightened cars and jets, saving fuel and pollution, and saved lives with helmets, incubators, and equipment for, for clean drinking water. Today, single-use plastics account for 40% of the plastics produced each year. Half of all plastics ever manufactured have been made in the last 15 years. Production increased exponentially from 2.3 million tons in 1950 to 448 million tons by 2015. Produ production is expected to double by 2050. Every year, about 8 million tons of plastic waste escapes into our oceans from coastal nations. That's equivalent to putting five garbage bags full of trash on every foot of coastline around the world. Plastics often contain additives, making them stronger, more durable, and flexible. But many of these additives can extend the life of products if they become litter, with some estimates ranging to at least 400 years to break down. In the spring of 2001, we sold reusable produce bags and stainless steel straws. Hanson's Independent allowed us to set up a stand in front of the store. Our stand was set up in the middle of June to the end of August. We sold 375 sets of reusable produce bags before we left for school in the summer, selling over 1,000 sets in total. With the COVID-19 pandemic setting in and the amount of disposable PPE being produced, we decided to purchase PPE recovery initiative boxes for the community. Through Green Circle Salon, the PPE is sent to a waste energy facility where the PPE is incinerated for clean energy and the ashes are used in construction material such as asphalt and bricks. Through our own fundraising and grants received from the community, we have purchased over 50 PPE recovery initiative boxes for the Huron County community. Many of those that we purchased boxes for have continued the program by purchasing their own PPE recovery initiative boxes. As for our future plans, we currently have a PPE initiative going right now, and we've applied for another grant. We've been picking up litter along the Morrison Dam Trail every other Friday, and we have a pop-up shop coming selling waste-reducing items. We encourage everyone to explore ways in which you can reduce your waste every day. First, start off by finding more about our experts featured in this video today. They are a wealth of knowledge and have the experiences to help you understand ways you can reduce your own waste. Secondly, you can visit the Waste Reduction Week Canada website at www.wrwcanada.com to learn more and access a wide range of resources to help you get started.